Two. We're going to expand our weekly video segment to take you into the back shelves of your local video store. Back where it says horror videos and where kids are devouring some awful films that we call the video nasties. Are you freebasing inquiring minds want to know? I have to break free from this culture of mechanical reproductions and the thick incrustations dying on the surface. What the prime time gets. Along with the new flesh. The pain, I can assure you, will be exquisite. As for our deaths, come with me and be immortal. We have such sights to show you. We've got to return some video games. Hello, horror hounds, and welcome to the It Slays podcast. I'm your humble host, Rowan. And I'm the drain at the bottom of the hot tub time machine, Mike. And last but not least, it's Colton. And we are back, and we are celebrating. It's our Pride episode, everyone. Yay. Insert clapping sounds. Insert (laughs) excitement. (laughs) Fireworks. I like your exciting yay. (laughs) Uh, I am excited. He meant to say yas. Yeah, (laughs) yas. But uh, yeah, so, you know, we're doing a little differently this year. We're only, uh, normally we're like, you know what? We're going to get ambitious. We're going to do like four movies. We're going to do one every week. But we know that what happens when we do that, guys. I never edit them in time. And then you're getting Pride episodes in like November. Pride episodes. Yeah, I was going to say like, (laughs) it's like American Thanksgiving. And it's like, happy Pride. (laughs) You're still proud, right? (laughs) So we said, you know what? We're going to do the one, but we're going to make sure it's just stellar. We're only giving you the stellar episode. I, I'll say that. In Too this bad we didn't uh, pick a stellar movie to discuss, but uh, I guess here we are. <laughs> the shave. The shave. Spoiler alert. <laughs> so, uh, you know where we're going to start off uh, with after this intro is what have we been watching? What have we been consuming? And we will start with you today, Colton. Oh, man, we should have started with someone else. I haven't been watching or consuming very much here lately. Uh, we did our now slaying episode on crimes of the future, which was OK. You know, I've <laughs> read and listened to a whole bunch uh, since its release. It's very divisive, but uh, I'm more on the, you know, shrugging side you know it's all right i rewatched everything everywhere all at once which is still excellent and still haven't both seen you it. guys should still see it yeah i was gonna say i don't think either of you guys have seen it yet still excellent but uh my mood's a little low and it might be because uh following our jurassic park episode <laughs> i went out with a group of my friends to see uh, jurassic world dominion <laughs> and uh it might just be one of the worst movies i've ever seen <laughs> It's, I can't it's, believe that those words are escaping your mouth. Like it's Yeah, I know. I, I messaged a couple of my friends afterwards and I was like, I don't even know if I like dinosaurs anymore. <laughs> it was so Oh my uh, god. Yeah, it was it was so uh, like earth shattering to me. Like, don't get me wrong, I didn't like Fallen Kingdom, the one before it either. But like this one makes Fallen Kingdom look like a masterpiece. I won't and get listen, into the like de- I, it's yeah. I feel like you know, I, I can't speak for you, but I feel like even as somebody who was not a fan of those movies and not a dinosaur person, that there was a certain level of, like, hype for this and excitement. Like, am I right? Yeah, they had the original cast returning to, you know, so for most people that does something. For me, I was kind of like, oh, I think they're getting desperate. And uh, I was right. Um, Very minor spoiler for the movie. The main plot of this movie revolves around genetically modified locusts eating the food sources in Texas and then how that might bring about a global famine. And uh, I can't think of like a worse time for me to actually care about the people of Texas or the southern states. <laughs> <laughs> so oh I, I didn't really <laughs> uh, care too much about the main plot there. And then the second plot of the movie revolves around uh, immaculately conceived baby raptor that's essentially like jesus but a raptor oh Um, my god not raptor jesus please i I know i didn't have it on my bingo card but here we are (laughs) wow 2022 just keeps knocking it out of the park yeah but but no i mean awful movie all of the i went with three of my friends we all said it's 
honestly one of the worst things we've seen in a while like i i gave it a one star on letterbox which i think if you look at all the movies i've ever rated there's only like 20 that are one star so it, it's it's real shit it, it's awful so yeah that I actually not it. when i saw that i uh, like i actually gasped because yeah. I was like, a Jurassic Park, a new Jurassic Park movie, and like, I felt hyped up for it and everything, and then when I opened up Letterboxd and saw that, I like, <gasps> all the air went out of the room, I'm like, what? <laughs> I can't yeah, it, get over it. it, I can't get over it, yeah. Yeah, it would have hurt if I wasn't just like, laughing through the tears, essentially, you know, the entire movie. It, the, <laughs> yeah. the good thing about it is it never gave me hope. It was garbage right from the like very first scene, and it was just garbage the entire time. So by the time the credits roll, like two and a half hours later, it's just kind of like, I felt like me and my friends had like a shared traumatic experience. <laughs> like, it was truly bad. So, uh... Yeah, don't go see Jurassic World Dominion. Um, the And the only other thing I've been doing, I've been playing a video game called The Quarry, which I don't know if Mike ah. has checked out yet. But um, uh, I I haven't started it yet. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a week in a row at work, and I don't want to start playing okay. it because I know when I do, I'll be up all night. And so I need to wait until Thursday when I actually have a day off and I can sit down and, like, dedicate, you know, let's be honest like six or seven hours at least to it yeah, yeah but i've been i've been hyped about this since i was gonna get it on day one but when i realized that my schedule was not working out i was like no i'm not gonna start it <laughs> it's as much as i want to you know and as much as i loved like until dawn and stuff i'm gonna wait mm-hmm. i'm just i'm so glad you're playing it yeah if i wasn't recording this podcast i definitely would be probably hopping on to like have a couple of my friends watch me play through it i'm like on i think the last or the second last chapter so I'm wrapping things up, and sadly, I've had one character die, which is always a bummer because in these games, when they die, you feel like you're uh, losing like a significant portion yeah, of the game. Yeah, it's so yeah. they're so they're so well drawn, and it's always like so well acted and stuff. It's it's very it's devastating. Yeah, yeah they nail that like um, kind of like '80s teen slasher vibe. You know, it's set in the modern day, but it's still like you know the characters are very much like stereotypes or you know kind of yeah. leading into different tropes. The one thing I will say is like the whole mystery of it, um, unless they do a, fu- a twist, you know, it it was pretty obvious to me right from the beginning. So I was kind of hoping that, oh, this is a red herring. They're leading me in one direction. But it was mm-hmm. kind of like, oh, no, the, the direction they've always been leading you is the explanation, at least as far as I am. So, but yeah, no, I still highly recommend it. I mean, if you're a fan of Until Dawn, I'm sure you'll like this one. And uh, yeah, that's basically all I've been watching or consuming. What about you, Mike? Um, I have been working literally almost every day for the last two weeks, except for like two days. Um, so I honestly have pretty much just been like sleeping and working and stressing out 24 seven. I did, however, the other day over the weekend, get a couple hours to finally watch and by finally i mean i had to wait like two days the wonderful new movie which is pride related but not horror related fire island starring my husband don't try to steal him joel kim booster so that that's really the only thing i've watched in like the last two weeks and i absolutely loved it as you saw Colton on my letterbox. Yeah, I was gonna your, say your, I, your passive aggressive comment actually like gave me life. I, I I gasped when I opened my letterbox and saw Mike give uh, Fire Island a four out of five because that's pretty much twice as <laughs> you know twice as what he uh, gave Jurassic Park. So uh, I know, and it's like you know, kind of like a cheesy romantic yeah. comedy, right? <laughs> like I haven't seen it myself, you- but. You're you're uh, among the friends that have given it a very high rating on my letterbox. You know, most people yeah, are kind of like, yeah, it's good or it's okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like for what it is, it's really well done and it's very charming. And um, it's funny actually because it it did end up um, unintentionally bringing up some like interesting conversations about like film and criticism and representation and stuff in general because i was actually messaging steven from every horror movie on netflix about it um he sent me this article about how this lady on twitter who works i want to say maybe it was like the new york post or something anyway and she was like saying how because we used to like talk about the bechdel test all the time and just you know kind of like lightly throw it in and she was very seriously like saying how it fails the Bechdel test and everyone's like um are you really trying to tear down this movie about gay Asian men that is oh really... yeah I saw that on Twitter I think yeah like and it was or, yeah. It, it and yeah and it turned into an absolute like roasting 
God, Lord. Alison Bechdel even came, had to come out and <laughs> make a comment about it. So I thought that was really fun. Um, if if you watch that movie, you should check out the threads about it on Twitter and elsewhere because it's it's really wild stuff. It's it's a ride. Anyway, it was a fun movie, and that's really all I've done other than watch High Tension um, for this. So, Ro, what about you? Tell me you've done more than I have. I've I've been like literally baseline alive for two weeks, and that's it. Fire Fire <laughs> Island, the uh, the new Jurassic Park. It's just apparently take... twice as good. Twice as, as good. I I rated I rated Jurassic Park two point five and then gave Fire Island a four. And yeah. like within an hour, Colton was like, "Excuse me." <laughs> <laughs> I, it was honestly it made my day. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I haven't done much horror related. Uh, I mean, if you follow me on Letterbox, it's been a, a wild week. It's been a wild ride. Oh, girl. <laughs> Like Colton said, we watched Crimes of the Future. I think it one of the few movies we kind of were the same about on. It was yeah. just a shrug. Mm-hmm. And then I really I've been hitting the t- I've been hitting Tubi super hard at work. It's my long it's my long week this week. So like I work five days this week, and I'm just sitting there, and I'm like, you know what? I might as well get paid. I Colton made fun of me because I said I might as well get paid if I'm gonna watch bad movies and. Then he's like, why don't you just watch good movies? And I was like, who wants to do that? Yeah, he. I'm just like constantly finding out like these masterpieces or like, you know, critically renowned movies that Rowan just hasn't seen, especially from like, I feel like the last 10 years or so, there's a lot of things he just hasn't seen. Yeah, well. And then he's just watching like, I don't know, late 80s, early 90s, just like <laughs> garbage movies all the time. And then messaging me about them at like two in the morning. And I'm like, bro, I don't even know what movie you're watching. And then I'll search it up and be like... Oh my god, it's not even worth my time googling. <laughs> Some of my highlights have been uh I watched Demolition Man for the first time, which is like okay, fan- I knew that What? One. Yeah. It's, it's okay, fantastic. you did not send that to me. That is a fucking masterpiece. It, I was I okay, I hate Sandra Bullock. Like I'm not a Sandra Bullock fan, but she's awesome in that. And it like Wes Snipes, Stallone. I'm not a big Stallone guy either. I it was just it was awesome. Like Way better than I expected, you know, it, to shock to most people. I watched Gladiator for the first time ever. I saw that. Yeah, guys that I work with, it's like all of their favorite movie. And I was just like, ah, I never really saw it. Like, unless it's Are like... Are they homosexuals? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Okay. Uh, maybe just checking maybe i don't know uh but yeah like <laughs> did, did, did you ever see airplane that scene in the cockpit where he's like do you like to watch gladiator movies <laughs> <laughs> i i liked it i thought it was pretty good uh i was surprised i hadn't seen it i mean i i've said over and over again that like movies set in that time period are really not my thing like i'm not a game of thrones guy like it just something about it, like swords stuff like that just isn't doesn't do it for me but you know i thought it was awesome joaquin phoenix is like incredible in that so i'll stop talking about because like everyone's like yeah i know we saw it like 15 years <laughs> 20 ago 20 years ago yeah yeah jeez. Yeah, <laughs> i finally got to the theater saw uh dr strange colton was quite angry uh that i gave it a four out of five i did mean to give it like a three out of five but i was also peeing at the same time and then I hit four, and then I uh, just too lazy to change it. I didn't hate it. I didn't hate it. I mean, uh, can I just can I quote your text message to course, me about it? Of course. Ro just got out of Doctor Strange. Me, how was it? Ro, it was a Marvel movie. <laughs> like, <laughs> four out of five. Four, four out, out of five. five. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, you know, we, we kind of know what we're getting with Marvel. I, I guess I was excited. Like, I just, I enjoyed all the, all the, like, Evil Dead references. There was, like, some Drag Me to Hell references. I like the Sam Raimi stuff, and that was pretty much, you know, I, I guess any little high point in a Marvel movie, I'm like, wow, yeah, this is awesome. Because I'm just so inundated with it now. Uh, I'm trying to think, like, notable uh, so I watched uh, Throw Mama from the Train, which I... That's the notable one? <laughs> yeah, it was actually pretty good. So it's directed by Danny DeVito. 
it's his take on Hitchcock's Strangers on a Train. Strangers on a Train. <laughs> it's actually quite good. <laughs> yeah. So I watched it. And I'm like, I know I'm not going to pay attention to this. And I was on my phone when it started and then literally like captivated, put my phone down and it was really good. Danny DeVito, uh, like stellar performance. He plays like this really creepy guy that's like a stalker and is like, you know, kind of the murderer of the of the film. Uh, Billy Crystal, I'm also another guy that I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> Billy Crystal exists. He exists. I feel like I'm just too young for Billy Crystal. Like, I feel he was a little before me. Yeah, he doesn't overly do it, but I highly suggest people uh, people go watch that. And then the only other two I'll talk about, like I said, go to my letterbox if you want to see all the trash I watch. Because I watched a lot of trashy stuff. But uh, I watched the new Adam Sandler Hustle movie on Netflix. Which has been getting a lot of press. Because I think it like be- it beat out Uncut Gems so far on Rotten Tomatoes. And it's his highest rated Rotten Tomatoes rating for a movie. I can't tell if you're being sarcastic or not. <laughs> no, I read an article like a day or two ago that it's like... I think it's his highest rated one. It was when I watched it, but it, it's been pretty uh, critically. It seems to have done fairly well. Uh, it's a stellar performance. If you're in, you know, I, I've mentioned before, like I'm a big basketball guy. So it's a basketball movie. There's lots of like NBA players in it, but it's just like an awesome, like drama performance from Adam Sandler who is like a, a scouting agent that travels the world and he doesn't want to have to travel the world anymore. He's getting older. He has kids. Queen Latifah plays his wife, uh, which is pretty sweet. And it's just like a love letter to Philadelphia, which is kind of cool. So like all the music, all the hip hop and stuff in it are Philadelphia artists. He works for the Philadelphia 76ers. They have, like, all the players in it. Uh, But just, like, Sandler, another guy that I'm just really not big on. And he's fantastic in it. Uh, Just, like, 100% amazing. And then the only other thing I'm going to mention, that which I messaged Mike, I messaged Colton about it. I watched 2002 Rollerball. And what a ride, guys. What a ride. Why no one that listens to this podcast ever wrote me and was like, you need to watch this movie. It is so crazy. I was like, every when I watched it, I just, I felt like I, I injected drugs. I injected adrenaline right into my veins. It's like so ridiculous and over the top. It hurts your head watching it because like, the cuts are so bad. Like, it's just going back and forth. They're playing a sport they never explain. You don't know what's going on. They're just throwing metal balls and, like, punching each other in the face. Yeah, it's just, like, really bad acting with, like, new metal music all over it. Can I please quote your review? <laughs> what? I, I don't have the review up. Uh, quote... This is the strongest one-star movie possible ever made. It's true. It's true. Can we quote his I Get Rich or Die Trying review? <laughs> I like sometimes I read Rose review and I actually like cackle. <laughs> that was one I screamed when I read it. I'm like, so upset. I I just discovered it here while we're recording. But you think Fifty Cent's Get Rich or Die Trying is better than Eight? Way Mile? better. Way better, bro. <laughs> You need to get your head checked, I think. Way better. I don't, I don't, I'm not, but it's also like, I'm really not an Eminem guy and I don't like Eminem. Really, I'm just not an Eminem music guy. So 8 Mile just didn't really do it for me. I've always been a 50 Cent guy. And so, like I said, mostly it was the music that I was like, this is incredible. Although I I did say in my review that it was a fifth section because 50 Cent was listening to his own music when he was a child, uh, which was incredible. Get Christopher Nolan on the phone. I'm waiting for Get Rich or Die Trying too. Anyway, uh, that's enough. That's enough. I I didn't want to talk about Get Rich or Die Trying. (laughs) Well, here we are. Yeah, but here we are. Uh, So that's what we watched. Uh, And since this is the Pride episode, we wanted to take a little more of a left turn because if there's anything we're known for, it's taking left turns in our conversations. And... uh, (laughs) We wanted to do some Pride recommendations. It's Pride. You're listening to this. 
maybe you're not like us that like, oh, you got it on the calendar, Pride Month starts, you know, I've got I've got all my stuff lined out. I have like a extensive collection of Pride socks. So like I, I'm wearing Pride socks all mm. month. But you, you might be thinking to yourself, like, you know, I'm I'm wondering about books. I'm wondering about movies. Like, how can I dip my toe in the amazing pride world in cinema and just everything. Uh, and I figure we'll start with you, Mike. I, I've already been talking forever. So I think Mike's got some book recommendations for you that uh, you should check out. Uh, yeah, I've got some books here. Um, I figured, you know, because everybody should should read a good horror book, but especially a, like, you know, LGBTQI2S plus mm-hmm. horror book. Um, these are most... Most of them are recent-ish, and then there's a couple of, like, what I would consider sort of modern classics. Um, the first one I want to suggest is one that I... It's not next on my reading list, but the one after that. I have a very extensive, huge reading list right now. Um, but I've been meaning to check it out for... Because it came out probably two months ago. Um, everybody I know who has read it absolutely adores it and everybody who's into horror adores it and it's uh, manhunt by gretchen felker martin um it's like a trans horror book and the cover if you have ever wandered into a bookstore and seen it is absolutely breathtaking because it's a couple of i think it's plums in like you know one of those like mesh sacks Mm -hmm. that fruit comes in sometimes but it's two of them and it it just looks like a ball sack (laughs) It's a ball sack made out of plums. It's absolutely fucking brilliant. I cannot wait. Everybody says it's this like absolutely crazy horror horror novel. I I'm I'm really can't wait to like sink my teeth into it. Um, as soon as I finish the the two that I have lined up now, and the next couple are definitely ones you need to check out. Her body and other parties by Carmen Maria Machado. Yes, she is this like wonderful queer author. This collection. I mean, it's not strictly speaking horror. It's kind of like um very like hard to pin down genre wise. It's like horror, fantasy, surrealist, uh, magical realism. It's short stories. Um, you should definitely check it out. Like she also has this really great um, memoir called In the Dream House. Amazing. Then we've got Exquisite Corpse, which is kind of a '90s classic. It's the serial killer novel by. Um, a trans author, Poppy Z. Bright, who I'm assuming he still goes by that name when he writes. Um, like, please let me know if that's not the case. I did Googling and I couldn't turn anything up because that was that was what he published books under before he transitioned. But I think the books still go by that name. Anyway, it's this absolutely insane, amazing, like New Orleans serial killer novel. But all of his books are phenomenal. So really, you could substitute anything by him in there and it would be A+. Uh, another one is more short stories. Um, another classic, Books of Blood, Volumes 1 through 3. There's two Omnibi. Omnibuses? Omnibi? Does anybody know how to say that? No I want to say omni- <laughs> Omnibuses, but that doesn't sound right. I feel like it's like Omnibi. Anyway, so Clive Barker, at the beginning of his career, put out six short story collections and they are now published under two thicker collections so you've got one to three in one collection and four to six in another they're both literal masterpieces but one to three i think is like kind of essential and it also there's not like clive barker is a gay horror writer but like there's not often a lot of like explicitly like gay themes in his work there's stuff that's kind of like tangentially like you know in the, like the hellbound heart and hellraiser and stuff you have like the snm culture and stuff like that but like that collection does have one or two stories that are like explicitly about like you know same-sex couples and stuff so i'm just like throwing that one in there because it's like a little bit more pride related and the last one is, I feel like I talked about it when I was reading it last year, and I know I've texted Ro about it a million times, but it is one of the best books I've read in like 10 years, and it's Red X by David Demchuk. Amazing Canadian horror author. Uh, check out all of his work. Uh, he's been like a Giller finalist, like literally brilliant. Um, there's a section in Red X because it's this very like unique melange of like kind of memoir and fiction and like historical fiction and horror kind of all mashed up and there's a part where he talks about like what horror means to queer people and it is to me like you could 
take that out and teach it in university. You could teach it in like a film class, an English class, and it's just brilliant. So those are like my book recommendations. There are so many more, but I mean, that's just kind of like the tip of the iceberg. Uh, Ro, what do you got? What do you got? So I'm doing the movie end of this recommendation. If you follow us on Instagram, I posted like some stories of links to episodes. So I will re be repeating some of those in these recommendations. Yeah. So obviously, you know, uh, cruising was one of our, it was pre Colton, but one of the podcasts, I think favorite pride picks we did. Wait, was it the first though? It, it was the first one we ever did. Oh my God. Oh, the memories. Uh, Al Pacino, uh, really cool, like American style giallo kind of like it's very leather gloves, knife stabbings, but uh, just iconic, super iconic. One I didn't mention in the stories that I don't think we went into when we reviewed it thinking that it was going to be this huge uh, read on it, but The Lost Boys, I think there's a lot of academic work and a lot of just critique work being done recently on The Lost Boys and kind of the queer reading into it, which is heavy, I think, in it. we When we reviewed it, we said that it was... Uh, it was very apparent. Uh, another one, which was kind of Mike's, Mike's one of his favorite, and I quite enjoyed it, was uh, Night Warning, Butcher Baker, Nightmare Maker. Uh, another fantastic one, uh, Heavenly Creatures, A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, which I feel is like kind of everyone's top list. Any horror people you follow, that's the iconic one and that one is fantastic followed up with scream queens which is like the documentary uh it's on shutter that they did um, i thought you meant the tv show which is also very gay yeah you could also watch that <laughs> obviously you know i have to make a special special pause and note Check out Closet Monster. Everyone knows mm -hmm. when we reviewed that, that was, you know, pretty special to us. Uh, you know, a Newfoundland director, you know, Stephen Dunn is always showing love to us. And uh, hopefully we'll get him on soon. We, it, it's in the works. We'll we'll have him on. And I'm sure we'll talk about something super cheesy and cold. And we'll hate another person. So just hate Also, <laughs> shout out his new series just premiered in the states although not in canada which is criminal but we won't go there <laughs> <laughs> the queer as folk reboot yes i i have to watch that i'm super excited for that we get it in like two weeks so yeah thank god i just mentioned uh jennifer's body uh which i think is another one that you know over time like it's all over instagram right now and twitter and once pride comes up everyone's talking about jennifer's body which is it's great i love jennifer's body and knife plus heart, if you're in the dildo knives and <laughs> you're, uh, but more so not just dildo knives, but if you're into, you know, a movie that I, th I think is one of the more artfully well done pride picks we have, it's digging pretty deep, I think into what it's talking about yeah check it out because we also love that on the uh on the podcast yeah and i was gonna say like if you're if you're looking for maybe ones off the beaten path or you know we didn't mention i will say like shutter always has a list up and their list is pretty good of uh like a uh, shutter originals and like some classic stuff that that has uh has those vibes to it. So th there's always places to find out. Jesus, we went on, guys. We went on. We're going to uh we're going to get into our pride pick. Uh which was my pick, 2003. We're going back to 2003 High Tension or Switchblade Romance, I guess. I'm definitely not going to call it Switchblade Romance throughout the episode cuz I didn't find out that was a name for it till uh like last night. And it's a bad name. So I say we get into the trailer and then we'll come back and we will do the bio. Someone is hunting everyone around her. Friday, she will make him pay. High Tension. Rated R in theaters everywhere Friday. High Tension was directed by Alexander Aja and written by Alexander Aja and Gregory Levasseur. 
And the story is as follows. Best friends Alex and Marie travel to the countryside to visit Alex's family at their secluded country home. Soon after they settle in, a psychotic killer attacks, killing Alex's parents and kidnapping Alex in the process. With Alex captured, Marie will stop at nothing to save her friend, even if the killer is not who they appear. So, our first experience is, is this our first time seeing this film? Uh, we will start with you, Mike. <laughs> this is... Not only not my first time seeing this film, it is probably my 60th time seeing Why? this film. <laughs> Why? Mike? Girl, Why? I cannot, I cannot tell you how formative seeing the trailer. I, I don't even know what it was I went to see. The year-ish, it might not have been the year it came out. It might have been after, like, I don't know when it came out in North America. But, like, I remember, like, just going to see some random movie and... There was a trailer for this at the beginning of it, and I, it must have been a horror movie, like I assume, or like yeah. some like indie movie. And I was like, "What the fuck is this? I'd never heard of it before." And um, just like furiously googling it when I got home, <laughs> and I remember within a couple of months, like I would just be like constantly searching all the like torrent sites. <laughs> And within a few months, I think, like, I found a torrent of it and downloaded it because it was before it came out, I guess, on, like, DVD or whatever. I was going to say Blu-ray. I don't think Blu-ray existed at that point, no, honestly. I don't think it was so. that long ago. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, and I remember, like, finding it and watching it and going, like, holy fuck, I love this movie. <laughs> I watched it in my parents' basement <laughs> on their, like, shitty-ass, like, desktop computer. <laughs> Um, with all the lights turned off. And I think that was, like, kind of made it special. Because it was, like... I always find my basement very scary anyway. Like, uh, my parents' basement growing up. So, um... And then I showed it to all the people that I had gone to the movie with. Because, like, we would always go in, like, groups of, like, six. I was like, y'all, we need to watch this movie that we saw the trailer for. And so I had everybody over and we watched it. And then it came out on DVD and I bought the DVD. And then it came out on Blu-ray and I bought the Blu-ray and, like... Every now and then we'll just be like, oh, you want to see like a gory ass French horror movie? Boom. Got you covered. And I just watch it like all the time anyway. So yeah, this is like my 80th time watching it. I'm sorry, Colton. <laughs> I have my reasons though. I have my reasons. All right. We're going to have to get into those. Uh, believe it or not, this is not my 80th time seeing this movie. I actually, I think I may have mistaken this movie for like wrong turn or something based on like one of the posters. I think of her like holding the the buzzsaw or whatever. I feel like there was a very similar poster to Wrong Turn. So in my head, I was like, oh, I think I've seen this. But yeah, when I started, it was pretty obvious I've never seen it. Uh, I've seen some of uh, Alexander Aja's other stuff, like uh, his Hill ha Hills Have Eyes uh, remake was, I think, the first like rated our horror movie that like I snuck into in a theater like I think I was like 14 or 12 or something at the time and I like lied and said I was old enough to go see it um <laughs> so yeah I really like that when it came out but yeah no I've never seen high tension until now and I never even heard of like any of the discourse or the controversy or the ending or anything like that going into it so I was completely uh wow you know surprised by all the twists and turns I had nothing spoiled so yeah it's my first time what about you um, Rowan can I just say I have to tell you this quick story because you okay. brought up the hills have eyes yeah um because I'm ancient I saw that in theaters and my best friend and I went to see it and we decided that it was a really good idea to smoke a joint and then go to the movie theater and see the hills have eyes and i had to leave because i was having a panic attack because i was so high and it was so scary yeah man i i haven't seen that movie since i just thought out, that, is, that has happened to me twice in my life and that was like the hills have eyes i cannot think about that movie and every time i watch it i'm like okay don't have a panic attack you're fine <laughs> you know but it's like Fuck. Sometimes you should not get high and go see horror movies, by the way. Just, like, throwing that out there. <laughs> yeah, I was not high, but only, I think, half of my friend group actually passed for, I think, like, 16 or however old you had to be in Goosebumps yeah. at the time. And uh, I remember when I was seeing it, I was like, oh, maybe I wasn't old enough to see this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. Before I get into my first experience, I will say, uh, I just have to say, Hills Have Eyes uh, remake is in like my top two remakes of all time. 
Uh, I also of course. top two. Yeah, I, I would expect uh, anything to be in the that's, best that's remake big of all words, time. Row. Yeah. Or the worst. Man, oh, man. I, al- yeah. I also saw that in the theater uh, when it came out, and mm. I've rewatched it tons. I I own like a box set thing for it. That movie, like, I'm surprised I haven't picked it because that movie still is one of the only movies that like disturbs and scares the shit out of me every time I watch it. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, not many Period. movies do that. But no, this isn't my first time seeing High Tension. My first time seeing it was actually with Mike. Uh, Mike brought it over when I lived in Newfoundland and was like, "You need to watch this movie." I knew you would love it. I knew you would love it. Yeah, I I remember I remember liking it. Uh, I know Colton brought up that I had given it five stars on Letterbox. I'm I'm pretty sure yep. I I just kind of hit five stars like i wasn't really rating anything at that point i was just using letterbox as a log of what i was watching except you gave it five stars yeah i (laughs) apparently hit five stars so i remember liking it and i'll I'll get in uh how my second watch was but yeah this is only my second watch i was very surprised i don't own this i thought i did so it was a it was a whole hassle of me, you know, tracking down a copy I wanted to actually watch. But let's get into it, guys. The meat and potatoes. We know where we're going to start. Our favorite kill. Our favorite scene. We're going to go with you, Colton, because uh, I, I like the the hate that is in your heart. I feel like the Emperor from Star Wars. <laughs> Let the hate yeah. flow through you. Hate's maybe a little bit strong. It's just, you know, we're going to have to get into that ending and how it pretty much ruins everything. But uh, yeah, my favorite scene, I would say, is uh, the bathroom scene at the, what is it? It's like a car stop, trucker stop, whatever it is. Yeah. So yeah, basically when uh, the killer goes and like checks all the different uh, stalls in one bathroom and then goes to the other bathroom and it kind of inverts it. Like he, he's using the urinal and then... Uh, Marie has to like check each stall as she goes by to make sure the killer's not waiting in the stall for her. You know, no kill explicitly in that scene, but uh, I think that was probably one of the best or like tensest moments I would say in the movie for me as a first time viewer. Uh, what about you, Rowan? What was your favorite scene? So this is rough for me because I feel like the automatic go to is I love the decapitation, but yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to go that easy. Ro does love head. I, <laughs> yeah, that could be made for a couple jokes in this. Uh, yeah, in this exactly. Yeah. I got to, now that's some road head. <laughs> it's like my uh, second note in this not movie. Not that, not yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to go with uh, when we have, <laughs> when we have, uh what we view as the 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 guy the male killer killing the driver towards the end we've already had the reveal uh but when we have the buzzsaw and she's and he's going uh, through, okay. yeah. through the window and it's just like slicing his chest and this is also really going to depend on if you watched the cut version or the original uncut version because all the deaths are way longer in the uncut version and they're way more italian gore fests like so the camera is just like sprayed with blood it like lasts forever it's like dripping all down the camera you see great shots of like just as chest cavity basically like ripped open spraying yeah yeah, like spraying all that stuff and i loved it because you know no shock i i've said many times like i'm a huge fan of like italian horror movies italian Mm. gore horror movies i could see the like the love and the appreciation that aja like had for this and like that callback which to me, like, I know was intentional because, you know, I'm sure we'll get into it. Like, there's actually quite a few callbacks to movies yeah, in this yeah. movie. Uh, but, yeah, that was that was my all-time, uh, like, that's my favorite scene in it. I actually have the same favorite scene as colton um oh nice all right yeah i i i'm i'm really gl- i'm really glad you picked that scene actually because i think it's kind of um one of the like peak moments in this movie and i i think that no matter what you think of this movie and i know that it's one of those like rose opinion on everything it goes either you love it or you absolutely hate it right like 
But I find that everybody kind of goes, yeah, that was a good scene. To me, like what you said about it was totally accurate. And I think it's just such a like perfect crystallization of his like ability to like ring that absolute like white knuckle tension out which is like i i feel like he's taking these like horror tropes and just ratcheting them up like over the top as much as possible and i think that scene is like a really good distillation of that because he does it like five times during the movie but um to me it also really highlighted one of the elements of this movie that i think makes it really good and really creepy and really memorable and well done um that people don't really talk about a lot is the like sound design um because in that scene i remember like sitting in the in my parents i was about to say in the theater the theater of my parents basement that i made (laughs) um and with the headphones on watching this like shitty fucking pirate version but even in that the sound was so good and like when she's hiding in the um in the stall Every sound is like so crystal clear and it's so quiet and the whole movie has like barely any soundtrack at all. It's just like ambient noise essentially is the score. But like in that scene alone, like every step he took, the like echoes and um like her breaths, her like really ragged breathing, it's like really loud and you you know you to me it's kind of like you put yourself in there and it's like there's there's no music and if you're in there it's like is my breathing going to give me away? And like the clinks of like the metal, like the ax on the tile and even just like the dripping of the faucet and like the sound, the like sound of his like piss in the urinal. You know what I mean? Like it's so prominent Mm -hmm. because it's so quiet. And like, even if the sound wasn't as good as it is, that would have been like a really good, really tense, like kind of textbook slasher movie um cat and mouse scene but like because the sound is so good i find it like just completely amplifies it and i'm like they should like teach this as like how do you sound in a slasher movie because like to me it's just like holy fuck like it like literally it's like gripping the chair like it it really puts you there you know what i mean like to me the sound is so um magnified that like it just feels like you're standing in that fucking stall like waiting for him to stop pissing you know what i mean yeah and i just i just think it's so well done and and like you said the inversion and everything and there's like the scene where she's like looking in the mirror and the whole thing also this is a fucking gigantic ass bathroom and i don't understand it and it seemed like something out of the shining i was like is this the hotel of the shining is this the overlook like what's happening (laughs) you know it's like this fucking rest stop And this weird, random, like, huge, you know, eight-stall bathroom. Yeah, I feel like those are more common in, like, heavily populated, like, areas or, like, really big, like, truck stops along, like, the highway or something. Yeah. And, I don't know, the way, like, the storefront was portrayed compared to, like, the bathrooms in the back. Yeah, it definitely doesn't match up. It's, like, a small-ass little convenience store with, like, absolutely massive, you know, 16 stalls for the bathrooms. But, yeah, Yeah, I never noticed that the the bathroom seemed, like, as big as the gas station itself right like which i was gonna say very well to me could have been maybe like just kind of like you said uh, that kind of call to the shining like i know that they said they wrote that scene as a tribute to the shining like that's why they decided to kill i had no idea yeah that's why they decided to kill jimmy with the axe they said that was just Mm -hmm. like kind of their love letter to the shining but i really like that scene also because like you said where the bathroom is so like big compared to what we think of this building. I think it does add to, you know, that terror where it's like, you know, in reality, like not in her made up reality, but in Mm. reality, like maybe the bathroom's really small, Mm. but with him, like just opening each door, you know, in moments of terror, things can seem to last forever that are really seconds so that's kind of how i took it where it's like it's probably a small bathroom but it it looks huge because of all that tension and like it's just like oh so it's just kind of time and perception like playing tricks on us or i guess what they want you to uh to think i was gonna say i feel like before we like really dive in like is it worth it just to like talk about the twist 
So then we can kind of. I think we kind of have to bring it up right now yeah. because how I would naturally transition yeah. is how masterful that scene is, and then in retrospect, how it just I guess makes absolutely no sense after the twist at the end of the movie. Yeah. So uh, like, how do you know. guys feel about the twist? Like the, the grand twist of the movie is that you know Marie is also the killer, right? Like that that's the twist. But like, how do you guys feel about the movie? Because I assume both you guys are more positive on this movie than I am, and it's kind of like to me. That was a twist for twist's sake. And mm-hmm. l- literally with like five seconds of thinking back over the movie, it, like it doesn't make much sense. I know everyone writes it off. Oh, it's an unreliable narrator. You know, that's what everyone says. I've watched numerous films with unreliable narrators. I'm not someone who, if it's an unreliable narrator, I can't grasp it. This movie like literally makes no sense if it's an unreliable narrator because you just got a hand wave away so much of the movie or certain scenes to be like oh well clearly that one aspect of the scene was in her head you know she wasn't in the back with Alex as they were driving she was actually up front while driving in this truck and she was both places at once or whatever it's it's yeah go ahead what do you guys think of it okay I have I have several things I have to say (laughs) first of all I will say that unfortunately I don't really care how this seems I don't care if it makes sense or not. <laughs> like, I've never given a fuck about that, especially with, like, a slasher movie. To me, I was, like, riding this for the thrill, and from the beginning to the end, I got a thrill ride. But also, something that, like, I feel like in the years since it came out has been addressed more, but when it came out was not addressed at all, is the fact that Okay, so first of all, I don't read as many horror books now as I used to, but, like, when I was... Like, I started when I was, like, eight years old and started reading, like, Stephen King and horror novels. I was always going to, like, the used bookstore with my allowance and buying whatever horror books they had. So one of the... One of my favorite ones when I was a youngster was this one called Intensity by Dean Koontz, who is, like, (laughs) essentially second to Stephen King... For many years in terms of like, you know, King of Horror or whatever. And that was literally one of my favorite books for years. And when this movie came out, I watched it and literally two thirds of this movie is if you just took Dean Koontz's book Intensity, like beat for beat, like to the point where she's hiding behind the aisle in a gas station and everything. And, you know, she hides. Yeah, I I actually saw that on Letterboxd, like people saying that this is clearly like plagiarism on that book as well. And and when it came out, I had read the book and I loved it. And I it's so funny because so many people are like slamming it for that. And I'm like, that was my one of my favorite horror books growing up. And I saw this movie and I actually was like. I love that they took that story and did this whole extreme French slasher movie version of it. So I'm not upset about it at all. But I feel like I was more forgiving of it because I really enjoyed them taking that plot and like trying to just take it and do this absolutely insane twist that made no sense to it. Because the twist was, as you said, totally for twist's sake. Because in 2003, blame M. Night, every single fucking horror movie had a goddamn twist for the sake of having a twist. And it was really annoying. (laughs) And I was like, honestly, at least I got a twist for the sake of having a twist that was also attached to a Dean Koontz ripoff. I just feel like there was better ways to do a twist that actually made sense in the movie. Um, Yeah. I totally get that. Yeah, it totally makes sense in that it doesn't make sense. And like, I've always understood why people have hated that. But I just like personally have never given a shit about it. (laughs) Because I was like, honestly, I watched so many awful twisty horror movies that this had so many thrills in it and it was so well done. I'm like, I just, it didn't bother me as much as some other movies. Maybe because it wasn't like some big budget like American movie. I was less forgiving of those for sure. Did you guys see like the quote that Koontz had about the movie? I, I was laughing. No, I didn't. I was laughing just because I was like, oh, maybe he's on the uh, Colton end. So Koontz actually addressed on his website about he was aware he saw the movie he agreed it was plagiarism. And I mean, Aja said, like, Aja admitted that he read the book and mm-hmm. that, like, so he was like, yeah, like, I was influenced He's by like, yeah, the book. Yeah, I plagiarized it. <laughs> uh, so Kuhn said that he, because uh, originally, I guess, he was talking about suing them and then said that he didn't want to. And this is a direct quote from his website. 
because he said that the film was so puerile, so disgusting, and so intellectually bankrupt that he doesn't want association with it that would inevitably come if he pursued an action against the filmmakers. Nice. I love it. That's like the classic every cult horror film. That's like the classic, you know... (laughs) You could put that in, when they re-release it. You that that'll be plastered all over like yeah. every cult horror film. Like they should be putting that on the front of re-releases of this on Blu-ray. Stephen <laughs> King must have oh, Stephen King rubbed off like, on like, yes, them. That's literally why I want to watch this. <laughs> yeah, I, I love I, it. I, I just love it. I thought it was funny. Now I'll say too, I I'm caught- but it's just so funny. You would think that as somebody whose favorite book that was. Not favorite, but it was like in my top ten, probably like horror books. Um, that I would have been offended by it, and I was just like, I love that they took this and ratcheted it up into this like insane, nonsensical, like amped it up to like twenty. Like it literally, the gore doesn't make sense, the plot doesn't make sense, but like I don't know for whatever reason, it just it really got me off. You know what I mean? Like. They turn yeah, whatever it, crank in my head. Yeah, it, it's it's a little different though. You you were mentioning like Stephen King, how he like speaks out against his adaptations. He's being paid for the adaptations. They have the rights to adapt it, and then he can speak out on it. You know, <laughs> Dean Koontz wasn't given a, a a cent for this. Someone just stole his story and made a half assed adaptation of it. From what I can understand, so I can understand him being a little bit pissed off about it and being like, you know what, it's not even worth you know, giving this movie more press, essentially, yeah. was kind of what it seems like he fell on. Yeah, but honestly, in 2003, Dean Koontz was already on the decline, so he probably could have used the press. <laughs> I say <laughs> that enough, as, I, I well, honestly, book, yeah. in 2003, I had probably read every Dean Koontz book, and I haven't read anything since, so. Gotcha. God love him. He, he probably could have sued them and used the money to buy some better wigs. Yeah, but Rowan, the twist, does it work yeah. for you? That was a little bit of a tangent, but, you know. That happens. I was going to say with the twist, I'm also kind of with Mike. Like, what I was very interested was with the second viewing, because my memory of this film was, I remember seeing the twist first and being like, holy shit. Because when I watched this movie with Mike for the first time, I had no idea what it was. I didn't know what it was about. And I was like, oh yeah, that's like crazy twist. But I thought with this viewing, I'm like, well, I know the twist. So how is that going to affect me? And I can't say it really did. I Like for me personally. No, because it's not set up remotely. It, it's just, once again, it's a twist for twist's sake. I, it's just I like, mean, it is sort of set up. They have that scene at the beginning where it's like, I'm chasing myself. <laughs> you know, where she has the okay. dream in the car. I mean, listen, I, it's not, it's not not alluded to at all. They like allude to it like four times at the very beginning of the movie. <laughs> all right. You guys are going to have to refresh my memory because obviously I okay, wasn't so looking for it. Okay. So literally but... the first shot of the movie is her saying like, they'll never tear us apart. They'll never tear us apart. Then it cuts to the car and she's in the car and she literally has the dream where she's Marie or not Marie. What's Alex? Alex. When Alex runs out into the road and stops the car and says, like, hey, de moi, you know, and that's when the scene happens where Buddy gets his chest cut open at the end. You know, oh, when she, yeah, she the, escapes. The very, when very, she is, very beginning. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, at the very beginning. And then she wakes up and says, I had this crazy dream where I was getting chased by a madman. But the weird thing is, it was me chasing myself. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Right? So they, there, it is, it's not a lot, but like it is alluded to in a cursory manner at the beginning. They do. Yeah, I, I guess they the do. They do put something the in there to. Begins. Yeah. Before yeah, the they, credit sequence and everything. Well, I mean, yeah, the flashback I I and then that, the, yeah. the dream, and they, they do address it in the car and then move on, because obviously they don't want you to pay too much attention to it, because it'll, you know, if you think about it too much, it'll, you know, give this... Was, frankly, and I didn't say this before, but I... The first time I watched it, I'd say probably ten minutes before the twist happened, I was watching it and went... I thought about that scene in the car, and I went, wouldn't it be funny if she was actually the killer? And then it happened, and I was like, oh, I actually like that I guessed that before it happened. <laughs> Maybe that's why it made me feel smart. <laughs> As a dumbass youngster. You there know? was also other like little things that I didn't notice till the second watch, but like when she goes outside to have a smoke at night, they like specifically she sees Alex's dad like in the living room and mm. in the living room is the shotgun that the killer has possession of later. Yeah. Just randomly. So 
then I was like, okay, like, you know, yeah, but the killer could have took that from the home if it was a legit, you know, if it was a legitimate killer. Right. But, but like I said, to me, what, like on the first watch, you're like, well, yeah, the killer would just grab it. But on this, like they actually, there is a shot where they make sure that you know that she is looking at the shotgun and then it's like, oh yeah. So that's why it's kind of in her vision also is like, you know, cause she, she sees the shotgun. So then she is imagining the guy with the shotgun, even though she has the shotgun. I will say this, Colton, definitely with this movie, you gotta, you gotta give it some room. Okay. Like what is the, what is the explanation of the shower scene? Then we all love the shower scene. What's the explanation of it? We're, we're already saying like, oh yeah, it's an unreliable narrator. So it's a, sh- it's a bathrooms 10 times the size of what it should be because they're paying homage to a, a movie that's far better than this one, which is literally like the the sin. You can never commit that in movies. And I mean, this movie just constantly references Texas Chainsaw Massacre and apparently The Shining. It's like, bro, why are you even referencing those movies? So, but like, what is the explanation? Like for that shower scene then? Why is she creeping around in the stalls? How, how is she pissing in the urinal or not pissing in the urinal? Or what is going on in that scene? Like, I mean... Like it's <laughs> over over intellectualizing a slasher movie is always going to be a like yeah but but this movie is literally futility. like th- this movie is like literally you throw a rock after you see the end of the movie and any scene that the rock lands on it makes no sense anymore yeah like I mean like the, to the me it's like last scene. week I watched a movie about dinosaurs being cloned of like i suspended my disbelief it's not the same but it also kind of is of like bro that movie takes 10 minutes to explain to you how they clone <laughs> dinosaurs and fill in the gaps in the I dna know, and all that stuff so it's internally realistic. consistent <laughs> no i'm not saying it's realistic but it's internally consistent this movie it's like no matter what explanation you have to make this twist work where people are like oh it's all from her point of view no, it's not, because one of the first scenes where you see the killer where he's giving himself fellatio with a severed head, neither of the characters were there to witness that scene. Like, True. Like, I think like, it's in her... That, I, see, that makes to no me, sense. I thought, like, that yeah. se- I thought, especially where the scene is placed, I thought that was just, like, in her mind. The same as, for me, the bathroom scene where... I don't think she used the bathroom. I don't think she went in the bathroom. I don't think that place really had a bathroom for you, the use that looked like that. I think she went in, she killed him, but I think... And then dreamed about the bathroom for 10 Like, minutes. I think all of this is in her mind. Mo- like, it's in her mind. Because to me, for the, like, for the ending ending where she's handcuffed, you know, in the hospital, mm-hmm. I kind of took that as, okay, everything we just saw in this movie is not... We're not watching it as it happened we're watching her sitting on the hospital bed thinking about what happened that's what i took from it i was like so we're we're literally getting this story from her this entire story it's like me in the room with her and her sitting on the bed saying this is what happened let me tell you this story i just feel like there's a way better way to do that movie and make it internally consistent where like uh the killer and alex don't like constantly cross paths and have to be driving two vehicles at once and be fighting and bludgeoning each other to death like i feel like there's a movie where like when you watch it a second time you go like oh this is cool like everything was set up perfectly this movie is not that movie it's incredibly messy no. I can, uh, you know I can, of course it's, it's a messy the, new wave french slasher movie yeah and i it mean and a it's mess. competent it's an in those mess. aspects it's just to me it's like just, like personally I am not bothered by any of that. Like, I do not care. I look at it as it's a thrill ride and there's these like five or six set pieces that are just stunning and beautiful and well shot. And like, I try to put the pieces together and when they don't fit, I'm like, "Eh, I enjoy, I enjoy it visually. I enjoy the thrill of like this scene and then that scene and then that scene. And, you know, I'm like, not everything's going to be high art. So and I, I, and I, I understand it, you're saying like it's a slasher or whatever, but like Friday the Thirteenth, like part one, like makes way more sense than this movie. Like I like, know, but thing, like like it, <laughs> literally, I just the yeah. individual pieces are so thrilling that I don't give a shit that literally none of them fit together. And I know that they don't fit together, and I understand that. But to me, I just it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I just, I'm not bothered by it. I look at it and go, this makes no sense at all. And then I look at it and go, I also don't give a shit. You know what I mean? Like, sometimes I just am not bothered by 
like it's just so aesthetically um and viscerally appealing that it, this is yeah, one of those I, weird occasions where like I, it just gets me on a visceral level it's not intellectual to me at all <laughs> even though people try to over intellectualize it and i'm like i get that but I just this is a visceral movie to me. It's it's purely in my guts and my eyeballs. I wonder too, like, uh I know there was like a bit of interference when like with the script. So originally from from what I can understand, a lot of the stuff when you look at the movie, of course, like they're translating like French interviews and stuff like that so some of the things but I I had saw that uh one of the producers or something basically came in with the original script and kind of demanded the twist at the that far in because apparently the working script was supposed to be you actually don't find out till like the last 30 seconds and there was going to be a second movie that would then, ex- like, then look at her point, uh, Marie's point of view. You weren't supposed to ever see Marie's point of view in this original movie. It was only supposed to be the male killer. Then the cops would bring the TV in, they would show that scene, and that would be the end of the movie, and then the plan was... They were going to make a second movie, and then it's the same movie, but then from Marie's actual, like, what she actually did and how it would work. So I also wonder if maybe it was a case where they were like, okay, because I'm going to assume they didn't have that second script done. So maybe it was a thing where they're like, all right, we have this. So then when we work on the second script, we'll then, like, work out how Marie is in these places and how, she, like how what's going on and how she views it where it seems that the producer was like no 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 like you you, at this point in the movie you need to give the twist and then like this needs to be wrapped up and it it just seemed that Aja had said a couple times in a couple interviews that like he wasn't happy with the twist everything I read says the opposite that he defends the twist to this day and he still thinks that the movie works perfectly with the twist and from my google there about like script interference I couldn't find anything there but I mean I'll I'll take your word for it but I, I'm not buying that it was like oh he was forced to put this bad twist into the last 20 minutes of his movie because I mean you still have to shoot and produce all that like I you know and it would all I mean, have to be like written, I said right? I I also like I said I like I twist doesn't overly uh overly bug me at all but uh and you know I don't think it's anything that he should uh I'm tr- I was just looking I had gotten that that was like on the IMDB is where I had read that. Uh, like on the trivia or something? It was like in the spoiler section. Yeah, I wonder if that's like actually like Luke, quoted to anything. Luke or whatever, Besson, but... I think. Luke Besson. Yeah. Luke Besson. It said Luke Besson was the one that had like made the suggestions for the twist change. Yeah, he's the guy who directed like the fifth element and whatnot, right? Yeah. Sure. Yes, which the actress Mai Wen was also in who played Alex. Yeah. In that iconic role with the crazy And blue and the thing is is like hair. <laughs> Yeah, like Luke Basson is not even a producer on yeah. this movie, right? It was probably like literally a friend or someone that helped out you know, like he he showed the movie to this guy, and he's like, "Oh, you should yeah. reveal the twist," or like he he read an early script or something, right? Like that's the thing. Yeah. I I I believe this movie was made the way he wanted to make it, and like I said, everything I've read and all the interviews, and like I said, I read a, f- a few think pieces after the fact, just basically being like, "Does this movie make sense?" And he still like defends it to this day because people still question him over it, basically being like, "Why did you make eighty percent of a good movie?" Essentially, is like what everyone questions him on still to this day. So uh, now I will say I I do like I know I don't know if you had read I'd read that I, the original concept was it was all going to take place in the house. I think I like that idea better. I mean, I love yeah. the location. Now I, I want to flip flop a bit. I I do also see your side of things, Colton, where I really like the killer in this. Like, I think he looks good. So I think if there was no twist and it had just been like this slasher this killer i think you could have equally made a cool home invasion brutal movie like i like the fact that we know nothing about him like he's just this ambiguous killer uh that you know likes to fuck heads that are cut off (laughs) 
Maybe. Maybe. Unconfirmed. We're not sure if that happened or not. Or... The, we'll have the to check with the narrator. Fellated um, by a decapitated head scene. Yes, of course. Yeah, and then there's certain people saying that that's supposed to be uh, Alex's head. I don't know. I, I looked at it. It doesn't look like Alex to me. But Yeah, no. You know. I, I Yeah, see, look. I like that we're just like, well, and then I read. So I saw that Oz just said it's not Alex's head if you look at it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> he said everyone. Yeah, I looked at it. it was like, was it looks a- nothing like it. But yeah, I, he said if you actually look at it, it it's not Alex's head whatsoever. Mm-hmm. But everyone had approached him about that. Yeah, maybe maybe move on from the twist. We're certainly not going to agree on this. Yeah. You guys we're, are much more about the journey rather than the destination. I like. Yeah. Yeah, I like where when we make it to the destination, like the road trip still makes sense, and I still had a good time. Not that it was <laughs> shitty. So you know, I, I love when I I love when I take a trip and then when I get out of the car, I'm in Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where the fuck I am. Well, let's 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 talk about the kills now. Let's. Uh, I, I'm interested to talk about. You know, like I said, I I've seen the censored version. I've seen the uncensored version. I'm like curious what you thought about the kills, especially we need to. I guess it's kind of to put this in context. Like you know this this film is uh you know a French New Extremity film, and which are you know notorious for being like pretty much you know hyper realistically violent or just like kind of disturbing unsettling and yeah i I was just kind of wondering your opinions because i i think that the american release or the uk release is i think what it's officially called which is the censored version totally eliminates that like i don't even think it has like a slight resemblance to anything in that like the french new extremity area i mean we get like the throat slash the decapitation the buzzsaw like yeah i I just curious on your opinions on on like the gore level uh from what you saw like how you felt about it what you thought i have one word to say to you crunchy what do you think colton crunchy is it crunchy crunchy Uh, i mean i wasn't (laughs) gonna say that level crunchy (laughs) it was fairly crunchy i guess Uh, i was gonna say i i watched the unrated version and uh, i mean i know this is in like the french new wave and whatnot but i don't know something like martyrs in my opinion is like far yeah. more disturbing than this movie like it's it's not even close in my opinion like you know i obviously the the head crunch like where the head gets ripped off the decapitation there is pretty disturbing and you know there's an awful lot of blood that gets like flicked over that uh closet door you know in that one scene um i don't know it, it was stuff that like Honestly, like it's pretty commonplace, I'd say, in a lot of like modern slasher movies. Like it didn't, it wasn't too much for me at any point. You know, it, it was good gore, I guess. Is what I'll say. I was gonna say, so I like, I purposefully, I had, I had like the uncensored version on, then on my phone, I had the censored version, so I could literally <laughs> like watch them, the kills next to each other, and I just thought, like, you know, like I, I enjoyed the decapitation scene, and with the uncensored, like. We literally just sit there like the head's gone. We just sit there and it's just like spurting blood out and we're just like uncomfortably looking at it where the censored version, we basically see the head like kind of come off and then it just cuts. There's like nothing. Same with like the killing of the mother. The throat's cut. We see all the blood on the on the closet Closet door door, in the uncut. Like, you know, we see all the The blood pouring down her throat and it's like we get it at her face we don't get like the implied okay bro here's my question though because i don't know that i've ever seen the cut version or if i did it was probably that first torrent that i downloaded in like 2003 or 4 or whatever it was um before it actually like came out on home video but i keep thinking of that scene and there's there is the one shot like the one moment where i like i remember going like (gasps) And it was not, like, the giant throat slashing on her, but it was when, like, Marie is leaned over her, and then her arm comes up and her hand is gone, and it's yeah. just so unnecessary. Is that in the both of the versions, or is that just in the uncut version? I think... Because I, I feel like if they cut that out, it wouldn't take anything away from that scene, but, like, keeping it in is, like, a really, like... 
it shows how like unnecessarily like brutal yeah brutal it's being it's like not just like i'm killing her and slashing her throat it's like i'm gonna cut off your hand for no reason i think the censored version she doesn't put her hand up but you see that scene where she's walking out of the room and then it shows the phone on the floor in her hand yeah. i think it shows that so it's like oh that like, okay yeah you cut off her but hand. it but it doesn't show her like holding up her arm with no hand on it which is like again it's yeah. only like a little yeah. probably two second cut but it's like to me i could see how that might be a problem for people <laughs> what yeah. i'll say is that always having like a shitload of gore sometimes doesn't add to it like i'm thinking about like hereditary like if we saw charlie's head actually get ripped off and yeah you know blood be spraying all out of the window and whatnot like it doesn't add to that movie like it would detract from it like it's better to keep the reveal to the next morning when you see the decapitated head so i i would kind of be curious to see the cut version and to feel like okay did it cut with just going back to the decapitation did it cut at a moment that i thought was like the most effective cut where it's like oof i i almost mm. can like picture the gore and picture what happened yeah or like i'd have to see the actual cut in the scene itself because i i don't always defer that the gorier is better and i mean the difference between these two cuts is about a minute yeah so, like it's obviously yeah. it's basically just gore right is all yeah. they added they yeah. allowed each shot to probably have twice the amount of gore or like linger twice as long which i don't always think works you know in, in something like this which is a, a little bit more slasher like i would probably say go ahead like keep the yeah. gore in there that's kind of what people are there for right yeah so so i mean and and you know I do love talking about gore, but I did have a reason, like I said, I did have a reason for bringing this all up because like you alluded to Colton, like there was a lot of movies that kind of precede this, like martyrs in this, you know, French new extremity uh, genre that like really pushed the boundaries. And I was just, I thought it was an interesting point. I didn't realize kind of from what I read, like there was kind of like an importance to this movie that I didn't realize that this was kind of like, an American, one of the first American exposures to like this I was going to say, it seems like it was their bid at a crossover, like, and that's why I think they just were like, let's, the kitchen sink, right? Like, <laughs> and, and I guess, you know, just where I had saw it later, so I wasn't really, I guess I wasn't really thinking like, oh, this is 03, but for some reason in my mind, like, I thought Martyrs was like older than this and all that. I didn't realize that this was kind of like, the granddaddy of them like inside came after this yeah inside oh my god don't even get me started. uh them came after this like all of these like iconic french new extremities horror movies came after this and kind of then really started to push the boundaries of like you know what are we accepting to uh put on film yeah it's interesting too because when i google it there it's just apparently for the u.s release is where it got edited heavily yeah. like where they took it to two minutes right like yeah i th i thought you said earlier that you said the uk and i was just like really like in the uk they would edit that okay no US, well, yeah so. no I, I i thought i read maybe i read it wrong i thought i had read that the like the original somewhat censored with the minute was the uk version like oh, okay. Because I think what happened was it was an original release. Like, it got released. Because originally I'd read that the uncensored version was never put on, like, DVD or anything originally. And then they re-released it and gave the uncensored version. Yeah, from, like, obviously, I'm not reading up on this. But usually what happens with these sorts of movies when they release in the U.S., they flop. You know, they, they don't make what they make. And then basically they're like, oh, the push the DVD re release better will give an unrated version. Yeah. And then that probably has all the gore. So I bet that's exactly what happened with this because this wasn't yeah. a box office hit when it was released in the United States. So it's probably just like a year later they released I it. I was right? super surprised it made money. Like when I looked it up, I was like, there's no way this made any money. And I was like, well, at least it made over its budget. Like... I figured this would be like, you know, we made $300,000 and put it out on Blu-ray. I I think there was something about they spent $14 million on marketing. The, yeah, the I was going to say that. So I, yeah. I don't think they actually made money on this. Yeah. I mean, listen, the fact that, like I said, I was at some random horror movie and saw a trailer for this. Mm -hmm. That sort of yeah, speaks volumes it, right? to to yeah. how the reach i i never i mean at that point in 2003 or 4 or whenever it was like you know you would have had to been like probably pretty deep onto like the film internet to yeah to know about this you know and the fact that like i just went to empire theaters 
<laughs> and saw a trailer for this, right? It was, yeah. It, to me, sort of like definitely underlines how much uh, marketing they took. I, w- I wish release. I saw this in the theater. Like, to me, this would be a fun theater. I know, theater I know. I'm, theater watch. Even if it was slashed to bits, womp womp, I would totally have loved to see it in theaters. And also, side note on uh, what you were talking about, Colton, if there's one thing I miss as a physical media guy... It's the uh, the covers that have like the unrated, unrated, kind. Yeah. like yeah. man, I wish they still did that just because they were so so unnecessary, but they were just so two thousands. Yeah, all the raunchy like sex comedies of the mid two thousands that would just put like topless women in the background of all their scenes to get the unrated <laughs> cut with yeah, unrated man. over their boobs. Yeah, like, yeah. okay. It was Good like stuff. raunchy yeah. sex comedies and like really no brain, terrible like studio horror movies. Mm-hmm. All I can think of off the top of my head is like I have a I have a copy of The Unborn, which I don't think I've ever watched, but it's that classic. It's like The Unborn uncut, like, <laughs> and I'm like, was it really that bad anyway? Like, probably not, but whatever. So I was thinking that maybe you know we we've said I think we've been somewhat positive in talking about this movie. Do we want to talk about like some of the controversial stances on this movie well you guys are gonna have to fill me in because i have no clue just as a pride pick right from like the the first scene i just kind of assumed they were a couple already because there's even a there's a comment about how she went on a date and like made her jealous or i I, Mm -hmm. or they were they were broken up for a moment i forget like the verbiage they use but it's kind of like it implied to me that like uh alex was by and like they took a break or something and now they got back together again after the date didn't go well or something. It's like in the initial car ride, there was something there yeah. that made me feel like they were an actual couple. And I was like, oh, OK. All right. So then it took a long time in the movie. Like, I, I guess I just didn't realize it until like the movie was basically over that they were just supposed to be best friends. Because obviously I thought they were just doing the whole like, oh, we're friends sleeping in separate rooms at the parents house yeah. type of thing. Right. Yeah. What's the controversy? I'm not. But even... see, and this might be maybe that's a, a question that. We don't know the answer to. Maybe they were like a bi, weird, early, uh, what's it called? It's complicated couple, as they used to say on Facebook. <laughs> I would probably agree with that, but then wouldn't there have been like a, a time at some point where, yeah, once again, this is just like, they don't take the gag off of Alex the entire movie because otherwise she would yeah. spoil the twist. So there's exactly, no real, yeah. there's no depth to the com- <laughs> to the relationship. So I'm not sure. I was projecting purely from us making it a pride pick. But from what I understand, it's just uh, Marie Mary or er, killing everyone. So she has Alex to herself. Like that's. Yeah, that's... it's I mean, I guess it's like a lot of people hate it because they're like, you know, for the same reason that they hate like basic instinct and they're like yeah. oh it's you know like demonizing you know the like queer desire or whatever and it's like honestly that's way overthinking something that was literally inserted specifically to make the plot twist at the end happen i personally have never found it to be homophobic because that's giving it too much credit kind of going into what Colton was saying because it doesn't make sense. And I think, like, if you were to call it homophobic is, like, really, really, like, giving it a lot more, like, credit than it deserves. Yeah, I was going to say, like, the... So the couple articles I had read, because I was like, let me read, like, some because a i didn't know about the controversy stuff at all because like i said like when i when i pick this this is always on like major publications lists of like pride movies and stuff like like it's always included in those lists and i was like yeah like you know we haven't i mean because the lists are usually pretty short yeah because there's no representation at all so you kind of got to take it where you can get it and in a lot of those like whatever like buzzfeed articles (laughs) So, I mean, the the two words that I see that I read most articles had about this was that it was lesbophobic and transphobic. Uh, I didn't dig a lot into the trans stuff. I mean, I just because of what I read, didn't really dig into it. But I'm assuming that that had a lot to do with, like, queer relationships and, like you said, like, kind of... I know one uh, one writer's argument was like just in the time period of the early 2000s and the 90s and the 80s, how 
queer desires always like made you know people have mental disorders or like they're crazy they're the psychopaths of the movie and uh just like how dangerous those ideas are uh planting into you know like uh, lesbian relationships in 03 when like Mm -hmm. representation isn't there really like uh in tv or film but i also i i guess i kind of want to bring up because it kind of reminded me you know i i thought about the criticisms of Candyman and people talking about like oh well you know like Candyman being this iconic black character but he's a villain like he kills everybody so like it's a white guy writing it and you know, it's all the stuff about racism, but the black guy, like, he's he's the killer. He's killing everybody. And then, you know, we, we listened to the Candyman episode. We talked about all that. Yeah, I was going to say, except that he's actually the hero of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was also going to say, the, the new one reframes that, and yeah. you and Exilia hated it, <laughs> despite <laughs> they, refra- you know, they reframe that, and they kind of fix that issue, in my opinion. But yes. You know. We did. And <laughs> one of the main reasons I hate it, and you know what, I'm... I don't know why I'm looking. I'm not going to be able to find her name that quick. I Nina can't think of No, uh No. She's a scholar uh and she's oh, all wow. over Shudder. She's on like Cinema Noir documentary. She's anything about Candyman, like she's always in special features. I can't think of her name. I will have to I don't know. Next episode I'll find it and I'll correct it, but if you if you watch Shutter documentary, she's always on there. She's like the prominent black scholar on horror. And I always look at it in her frame of view. So I like I said, I took the Candyman argument over to this where it was like, okay, but proper representation in film and television also includes villains. Like why can't you have a great lesbian villain also? Like, it can't always be the hero. Like, you can also be the villain. It's about occupying these movies and having, you know, ideally, like, you have films that are just all different kinds of characters occupied. But it's also not bringing down the importance of, you know, I'm not saying high tension is iconic by, like, any means, right? But, like, I feel like most directors, when they make a film, they hope their film, like, lives on and, and has, you know, this lifelong wind where... It's like, you know, maybe you want Marie to be an icon. And, uh, look, Mike's just, Mike's got a book in his hand. He's just <laughs> waiting. The... He's so checked no, out was... of this conversation. He's just starting no, to No, 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 no. I'm, I'm not checked out. It's, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I said, fuck you both. I'm going to read a book right now. Um, no, I think that you, you do have a point in that, um, and this is why I've never really had a problem with it. There is a very, um, complicated, uh, relationship between like queerness and like monstrosity and stuff yeah and uh there is a real wave in like writing about horror about like kind of moving away from the you have to be like heroic and virtuous and um identifying with the monstrosity and it's just it's funny because i mentioned about how in david's book there's that section about dealing with like you know uh, queerness and horror and uh one of my books that i have signed by him he uh actually inscribed love your monsters and i it's just i always think of that because i always used to think i always used to kind of uh be in the mindset of you know oh i totally get it you know you don't want to like demonize somebody but then it's also like you know it's subversive to embrace the demon and the monstrosity you know what i mean yeah it's like it's almost like reclaiming a slur in a way i know that sounds really bizarre but like it's sort of like taking the power back and being like okay Uh, and you know like obviously they're they're not to both sides it but like there is an argument to be made about in terms of representation and stuff 100 percent, and mainstream like consumption but there's also a real argument to be made like from you know the opposite perspective of you know and and it has to be very careful like who's making that argument because there's some people that shouldn't be making that argument about certain other people but like yes there is there is that notion of you know when you're othered and pushed outside to embrace the monster 
You know what I mean? Obviously, that's, that's, you could, it's like hours and hours and the whole books can be written on it. So it's, bringing it up is almost useless because you can't, you can't delve into it in any depth, really. Yeah. And I was going to say, my, my version of all sides siding it is just read, read other sides. Because of course, you know, I'm talking about this in my opinions, like, I'm like a straight guy, so like... I'm, exactly. Yeah, that's I what have, I was gonna I, say. Yeah, yeah <laughs> like I, I have the lens, a uh, lens on that that like I, I'm just always gonna have. So definitely, like, and like I said, that that's what I did with it. Like, I was like, oh well, I need to read some articles from people that are like, this movie is the most damaging movie, like to the movement, and like read those, see those perspectives, and see that. And like I said, I'm just filtering it through what I'm thinking. But I mean. Who the fuck am I, right? Like, yeah. But I mean, and if I guess that's the whole thing. If you're gonna, if you want to do the reading on something, like if you're interested in, say, I want to like take an hour and read, yeah, about this movie. You know, maybe seek out all the perspectives, opposing and, viewpoints. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're, and it's worth noting too, right? Like, in at the same time, like we're talking about a movie about you know this this lesbian relationship or a, a lesbian relationship that they one party wants to happen that was, you know, written and directed by men, like in, in general, like it's not, it's not like there was anyone in that community participating in this movie. So, I mean, take it or leave it. That we know of. That we know yeah, of. I was gonna exactly. Say, yeah. That we know of. But yeah, it's the sort of thing like, is this movie lesbophobic? It's like, I'm not a member of the community yeah. that it could be offending, right? I have absolutely no clue. Yeah. And I completely misinterpreted the movie when I was watching it that since we had it as a pride pick, I thought it was very obvious from the beginning that the two women were in a relationship. <laughs> so, you know. It was but I like, like that reading. I like that you read it like that because I had no idea about any of that when I first watched it, like million years ago and so my you know my read first reading of it would have been like just vastly different from yours they're just friends yeah 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 Yeah. so uh let's take another left turn i feel like we've taken so many left turns we have to this is a mess of an episode it's a square it's a square we're back to the beginning it's a a square i just want to (laughs) say the the muse song at the end it's kind of oh yeah oh my god absolutely the soundtrack um like underrated the, the like three songs that are played in this so underrated the the reggae song when she's masturbating um i've never been able to get that out of my head and i i i remember like back in the day because uh this was during by the way for for all of you olds that might hear this this is back in the napster days and when i finished torrenting this movie i got a napster and <laughs> downloaded the the song that she's listening to on her mini disc player which also for most people they're like what is that it was like a weird small cd thing that was like the midway point between a walkman and an i an ipod <laughs> anyway yeah, yeah yeah and it's the the music the couple songs they use in it are mostly sick. Yeah, in, well, in and even like you said, the, sick even the way. the like ambient sound and stuff. Yeah, I wouldn't say like the you know, there's no one that is on a level of like the thing John Carpenter. But I thought it was pretty good in this movie. Like, I I think just the sounds and the music and and all that just. I thought it was it was really really well done. Well, it goes in with the whole sound design. Like I feel like the it was very deliberately as absolutely like minimal and icy and barely there and droning as possible and I feel like that just ties in with like the whole sound design and that it you know is meant to like kind of like keep that level of dread going and yeah. make you feel like you're standing there and like you're hearing all the like dripping and you know, you still have score because it's just droning in the background, but it's more of like a the hum of mental illness in the background. Let's call it. <laughs> <laughs> 
take that however you want. Like, So are you guys comfortable to go into rating it or is there anything else mm-hmm. that you want to talk about? No, that's fine. I'm fine with it. Nah, I feel like we've talked in circles and all over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, have we, notes could, we, never we touched could go on, on but for it's like, 10 more, ah, 10 more it's like, hours. It's not really worth yeah. extending the I think, discussion for. I think if you're a listener right now, I think you're getting a quintessential episode from the It's Lays podcast where- Just rambling we, on. <laughs> We ramble, we sidetrack. It's been a while since you've got a goodie like this one. What a mess. <laughs> I just want to say, yeah, 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 I want to say my notes for Jurassic Park were some of the shortest I've had in a long time. It was like a third of a page, whereas I filled a whole page and a bit for this one. So and my notes are we could exactly go the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I mean, listen, like the, yeah. Yeah. I love it. But engage us in the comments. <laughs> All right, well, let's uh, land the plane and get to rating this. Uh, If you're new to the show, our rating system is nay, okay, yay, or slay. Mike, what are you going to rate high tension? Okay, so this is going to sound weird, (laughs) but it's also going to sound Rowan-esque. I'm not giving it a slay. I would give this like a four stars on Letterboxd, but I'm going to give it a yay because like, like I was saying to Colton, I totally get that it literally makes no sense. And you could write a book about how much about this is fucked up and doesn't make sense and all that. But like, I I just found it very thrilling. And I think maybe also seeing it at like a formative era in my life when I was like, you know, OK, I'm going to be brutally honest, as I have several times you know, about pirating this movie. This was like the height of like movie piracy before it was before they started showing all those ads at the beginning of movies. Like you wouldn't steal a car. Exactly. And I'm like, (laughs) you know what? I wouldn't, but I stole this movie. Um, And that, but like for somebody who lived in Newfoundland in that era, when you did not have access to movies in any other way, you didn't have Netflix. There was no streaming. There was whatever you had at the, shitty blockbuster that was still open and whatever came in theaters and that was it but then this whole world opened up of people ripping movies and putting them on torrent sites and shit and so this was like the beginning of that for me and this was part of that like i get to watch all sorts of foreign horror movies that i never would have seen otherwise Mm -hmm. right so to me it just i love it and it just has that nostalgia factor and thrill factor of like seeing something other than and i didn't i made a note about this but didn't say it earlier like to me i saw it as a reaction to like the very sanitized like late 90s slasher movies like i know what you did last summer where you don't even see anybody getting stabbed or anything you know what i mean and to me that's valuable <laughs> I know it's it's very subjective, but like it's a yay subjectively because I still enjoy it and I still like watching it. And I if they put out a new collector's edition Blu-ray over for like seventy dollars, I'm going to buy it and I'm going to watch it and I'm going to make everybody I know watch it. So, yeah, totally a yay, um, a yay bordering on a slay, but I know it's not objectively a slay, but I love this movie. I'm going to volley over to Colton right now. <laughs> All right. I can't wait to hear his final say on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we didn't actually discuss too much of the like competent areas of this movie. Like, this was a movie for a lot of it. It, it never came close to a slay to me but i was like yeah this is all competent this is entertaining you know this is tense this is a good kill here whatever you know and then me misreading the movie i was like oh i can't wait to get some more depth on these characters and their relationship which never comes it but doesn't t- happen it's as, yeah it, it's as it's as deep as the <laughs> mirror reflections that they use in this yeah it's like literally <laughs> like nope we're gonna keep the gag on one of them and she'll never say another word until the last two minutes but yeah it, it's to me is like the ending is so bad that I can't give it a yay. It's like, for me, it was like consistently a yay. Ending is so bad that I'm like, all right, I'll give it an okay. And honestly, the more I think about it, next week it might be at a nay. Because the more I talk about it and the more I think about like why the movie ending kind of ruins a lot of it for me, it it keeps dropping down in my books. So it's like, for me, it's like kind of like it's a soft okay. It's like, you know, I... I don't know what to get. I don't know which way I lean. Yeah. I don't know if I lean negative <laughs> or positive on it anymore. But what I will say is, most of the movie up until the twist, I did think was pretty good. Yeah, so, but it's an okay from me. Yeah. What? 
What about you, Rowan? So I am going to give it a yay. I was kind of teetering. It was actually kind of funny because if we came in and had the same uh, answer, I I was going to give it an okay. Oh my God, I wish. <laughs> but I I will give it a yay. I had fun watching it. Uh, I wasn't expecting to have fun watching it because like I said, I, I knew the twist. And I was like, well, I feel like, you know, this is the sixth sense or like something like that where... Like, I don't really ever want to watch it again because I know the twist. Like, I I know everything about it. But I had fun. I think I kind of delved more into the pre-twist movie than I did, you know, before. And just really appreciate the kills. And like I had said, I really love the killer. I love, uh, I think his name was like uh, Felipe Nohan is the guy who played the killer. Like, I thought he did a really good and creepy job. It's also, I, I think, just an interesting thing to watch, you know, because like I said, I love the Hills Have Eyes remake. Like, I am a fan of this director. So what about kinda, Piranha 3D? Pra, pra, of course, Piranha 3D. So much fun. Or wait, was it, did he do Piranha 3D or was it Piranha 3 Double D? I think it was 3D. Uh, yeah, okay. he did 3D. <laughs> and he did crawl and yeah like crawl is a lot of fun you know yeah I and i just think it's interesting to see kind of you know the the starts uh where he kind of started to get his fame from but yeah so i i mean i'd watch this again i'm i'm definitely going to go buy it uh, i'll watch it many times so i've got to give it a yay i think it's also a really good movie if you're going to set someone down that martyr's path them inside like, this is probably a good beginner movie for that set, that French New Extremity, because this is probably the tamest of the It law. is. It's a little bit, it's weirdly, even though it makes no sense, it's a little bit more accessible than some of those. Yeah. Because it's it's weirdly, like, less nihilistic and obtuse than a lot of those French movies, so. Nihilistic is definitely the word. It's less nihilistic and it's not... You just sitting on your couch, like, asking Jesus why you uh, chose to watch these movies. I mean, maybe it was the time that I watched them, but I'm like, I remember watching Inside and Martyrs and literally was like, why am I alive? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> yeah. I was also very hideously depressed at the time, but like, they Perfect. certainly did nothing to help the cause. That's a heavy movie, man. Martyrs. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll be excited when we get to it at some point. Yeah. Yikes. But yeah, so you know what? I think two yays and an okay are, is way better than I thought this uh, was going to do. But uh, we've said what we thought about the film. Uh, we went on the old IG and asked you what you thought about the film. And uh, we did get uh, some answers. Two people answered us. Uh, so a podcast on Elm Street wrote, Love me some new French extremities. This Ooh. is probably my third favorite of the genre. Now, they didn't tell me what the first and second was. I'm curious, so... If you're listening a uh, podcast on Elm Street, leave it in the comments. I, I'd be curious as well. Yeah, I, I would be very curious to see what they are. And then, uh, you know, friend of the podcast, author Brad Dunn wrote, and he never lets down. He, he responded with an emoji, uh, and it was just a fire emoji. All right. Oh, and fun fact, Brad, uh, well I'm done. pretty sure... When I watched this with Mike for the first time, Brad was also with us, so... Yes, because I believe that was when author Brad Dunn lived next door to you. Yes, that's right, so... <laughs> <laughs> our next segment are you guys are you guys like sitting down for this one this is this is excitement on the podcast big news big news we're going to the horrific hotline uh for the first time in a long time someone uh someone loves us i guess somebody actually called in well i don't know they emailed in i guess a question <laughs> so uh yeah just give us a second to bring this up and you know we'll see what they have to say hello dale here Long time listener, first time caller. Happy Pride! Um, I have a Pride related question for you guys. So, do you have any horror movie character that made you question your sexuality? Or, you know, like, <laughs> oh, if you're man. straight, like, a character that you're like, I would go gay for this character, or if you're gay, you would go straight for them, etc. I'm bisexual, so it sort of doesn't work for me, except for that, like, a lot of 
people when I was young, I was still discovering my sexuality. And one of the things that, um, you know, I really helped <laughs> me sort of grapple with these questions was Megan Fox. Uh, and um, nice. <laughs> her and Jennifer's body, obviously, so hot, so incredible. <laughs> and um, yeah, so for me, that was like a big, uh, made me uh, figure out who I am. <laughs> anyway, do you guys have any experiences like that? Um, yeah. Uh, thank you for the good work and happy pride. All right. Thanks for the question, Dale. That was literally the most amazing question. <laughs> yeah, I can already see the wheel spinning in Mike's mind. There's so many things that could be said. Honestly, I don't even know where to start. But literally, one thing that I can think of is <laughs> the first thing that popped into my head was Nightmare on Elm Street 4 slash 5. And <laughs> Alice's boyfriend, Dan... <laughs> Remember he was that meathead? <laughs> the fucking like football jock. Oh my god. <laughs> That's a... Really, I gotta think about this one. <laughs> but also the brother, but anyway. <laughs> also her brother, who by the way follows me on Twitter. So quick question our sexuality. So it's gotta it's gotta be a man for me. Ah, uh, alright, I got it. I got it. My answer is actually my answer is really easy. The character name is David. The guest, Dan Stevens. Oh, okay. Of yeah. Yeah. Uh, very, very attractive man. That's my answer. I would say Tony Todd and Candyman, because I think uh The voice. Oh the God. voice. <laughs> like he could literally be like walk out into traffic and you're like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> the presence Wait, where, in the where? voice. <laughs> yeah. The looks, like I don't overly do it for me, but uh yeah. Maybe if you like had his voice and presence with Dan Stevens, then it be on. But uh, yeah, so that's my choice. What about you, Colton? Yeah, for me, uh, I'd also have to pick a man. I think uh, for me, I'd have to go with like a formative movie as well. So considering we just did Jurassic Park, all that's on my mind is <laughs> Ian Malcolm. <laughs> or when I was young, wanting to be a paleontologist so bad, Sam Neill. But I don't, I don't know who would go gay for Sam Neill. That's a, that's a very strange pick. I... But... Probably, Young probably Sam Neill back in the know. day. Yeah, I, I guess, but in Jurassic Park, Jurassic he's so Park, much of a dad. I was like waiting yeah. for you to say yeah. Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, Honestly, I have to go like, Jeff Goldblum. Yeah, I mean, for like my other Jeff, man Jeff crushes, Goldblum, it would be I like, think is like a bisexual icon. I feel like everybody loves Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> true I, I i was actually impressed with mike's answers because i thought mike was now just gonna list off every female he's ever met ever like talked about on the podcast in a horror movie and i was like well i hope you guys want to listen for another hour. uh yeah i'm not i'm not literally not gonna put you through that 45 minute fucking hell zone <laughs> yeah, i feel like every horror movie we do there's uh a female icon in there for Mike to gush over. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're not. We're, I I will not put you through that. We maybe our next pick because we'll probably still be recording it like in vaguely Pride Zone, especially Newfoundland Pride Zone because that happens in July. So maybe maybe I'll like sneak one in the next time. <laughs> and by one, I mean seventeen. But yeah. So uh, thanks for the call. No, I like I love that that call and that question by the way and like um much love to you by the way <laughs> yeah thanks for actually calling in and uh yeah i mean if you'd like to do so you can you know send us an email at it's lace podcast uh gmail.com or um you know uh, 1902-418-8620 if you actually want to call in and leave a voicemail uh but yeah if you're not following us already make sure to do so at it's lace podcast uh we're everywhere i think facebook instagram twitter letterboxd slasher you know if there's another social media out there at its lace podcast we're probably on there and rowan we'll what, how about it. you uh plug the spotify yeah so uh if you want a playlist full of music uh music and scores from horror movies horror movie adjacent stuff on spotify it slays podcast horrific playlist uh i got a big update i gotta do so i might actually have to do that tonight 
uh, I might have to add that Muse banger on there just so I can listen to it all the time from this. <laughs> but uh, yeah, go check it out. Go follow it and, uh, you know, get some spooky music in your life. Well, speaking of Muse bangers, can we just say that like High Tension did beat like Twilight to the including Muse bangers on the soundtrack <laughs> punch? <laughs> that, that's a good double feature. Uh, High Tension and Twilight. Just back to back. That is a double feature. I don't know about a good one, but <laughs> um, I feel like that would be a really good get stoned and watch it, and maybe if you're Colton, feel like you're in hell. Double feature. I think I prefer uh, Twilight over this one. So, <laughs> uh, so I think all that is left is to announce our next film. I will let Mike do the honors. It was his pick. Ooh, I love the honors. Okay. So I know that this is going to please a lot of people. Uh, so I picked American Psycho 2. <laughs> Fooled <laughs> you. Nice. Fooled you. Thought, you thought we were doing the Mary Heron masterpiece. No, we're going to skip over that. I mean, we might come back to it at some point in the future. But we are doing American Psycho 2 starring everyone's favorite mila kunis yes i've never seen this so neither nobody, have I, so nobody has you you saw this movie if you rented a video from a gas station in about 2003 or 4 <laughs> so so i.e nobody's seen it except for me so this is my way of spreading the awareness of this is my uh american psycho 2 awareness public service announcement <laughs> now it, it's been a while since i've seen the original american psycho you know is that required viewing in order to uh understand american psycho 2 absolutely not but yeah i want to say use this as an excuse to watch american psycho but also i want to advise against it because watching American Psycho and then watching this is really setting yourself up for disappointment. Maybe watch them in reverse order. Watch the yes, second one Yes, yeah, first. watch. Honestly, that's that's the best way to do it. Use American Psycho as a palate cleanser because you don't, even if you've never seen American Psycho, you'll get a little, like, blurb at the beginning of the movie that is going to, like, tie it in. So, yeah, just... Watch American Psycho 2. I'm sure it's on YouTube or something. It's fine. great. So that is everything for this episode. Uh, thank you for listening, for supporting. Yeah, so I am Rowan. It's Mike. Bye. And I'm Colton. See you later and happy Pride. We're going to expand our weekly video segment to take you into the back shelves of your local video store. Back where it says horror videos and where kids are devouring some awful films that we call the video nasties. Are you freebasing? Inquiring minds want to know. I have to break free from this culture of mechanical reproductions and the thick encrustations dying on the surface. But the prime time gets. Mom, the new flesh. The pain, I can assure you, will be exquisite. As for our deaths, come with me and be immortal. We have such sights to show you. I've got to return some video.